I invite you to be seated and open back up to 1 Timothy. We're at the end of chapter 3 today, Lord willing. We'll finish up this chapter and then begin moving on. This is the high point of this book. This is the theme of this book. Encapsulated great truths of Scripture here. Great truths throughout the Scriptures, obviously. And all of God's Word is good, amen. But here we find a high point. And so I'd like to just jump right in here. We're talking today about the church of the living God. The church of the living God. The Bible says much about the church, but I think here is, as we've said already, a high point in the description of God's church and God's plan. And so I want us to look at three key things here today, Lord willing. We're going to talk about the reason for Paul's writing. We're going to see Paul's description of the church. And then finally, a summary of the gospel truth here in verse 16. But first of all, look at verse 14 with me. Paul says, I am writing these things to you, hoping to come to you soon. Here we see the reason for Paul's writing. He wanted to be with this church. He wanted to be, this is the church at Ephesus, a church that he was instrumental in founding. He has Timothy there now, basically in charge with other elders having been appointed and instructing him how to be the church, how to lead the church. And that's what we find here in these pastoral epistles. First Timothy, Second Timothy, and Titus. Who to be as Christians, who to be as the church body, but how to be and how to do as the church body. And Paul found these people precious to him. And he wanted to be there with them personally. But praise God for his delay, amen? amen? Because since Paul was unable to be there, we have 1 Timothy. We have 2 Timothy written to us for our instruction, for our good, for our benefit. So as much as he wanted to be there, I don't know, maybe I'll let somebody bigger than me tell him, hey, Paul, we're glad when we get to heaven, right? We're glad that you did not get to be with the people in Ephesus. Because we have these two letters. His delay gives us this writing. He says, I'm writing these things to you, hoping to come to you soon. He wanted to be there. But look at verse 15. This is the theme. This is the purpose statement for which he wrote this letter, this epistle. He says, but in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. So let's note the second thing here is this description of the church. And we're going to spend the bulk of our time today looking at this description of the church because I believe, I believe our times warrant it. There's so much confusion about what the church is, who the church is, who comprises the church, what the church is supposed to do. And here we see a few things that are key. Number one, or A, if you're taking notes, this is God's church. He says, I write so that you will know how you ought to conduct yourself in the household of God. This is God's church, amen? This is not Kevin's church. This is not anyone else's church. This is God's church. You know, I say this oftentimes. I don't want it to be true necessarily today, but... The goal is that I could drop dead. It'd be awesome to do preaching. That's kind of the way I want to go out. That'd be awesome. I mean, not so good for y'all necessarily. That may scare some of you, but I think it'd be great to be preaching God's word and then to be in the presence of the word. Amen? Amen. Amen. I mean, can you think of a better way to go? So that would be awesome. Maybe a gunfire would be another. No, no, I don't want to do that. Just kidding. Just kidding. Don't want to do that at all. Right. But to be in the presence of God. Wow. But this is not my church. This is God's church. Acts 20, verse 28, tells us that this is the church that was purchased with Christ's own blood. Christ's own blood bought and purchased this church. Yes, there have been men and, and, and women who have gone before us, who have bled and died for the truths of the gospel. But no one has purchased the church of God with their life, save the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And it's His church. Ephesians 5, 25 tells us, In fact, it's describing here how men should treat their wives, how we're to relate to our spouses, how we're to love them. And in this epistle, Ephesians, we're going to turn to here in a few moments, but but what Paul says in 525 is that we are to love our wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. 
This is how a man ought to love his wife, the way Christ loved the church. Now, we strive for that, but I dare say there's probably none of us who perfectly exemplify that yet. Amen? Amen. I don't. I try. I fall way short. But this is the goal that we have, to love our wives the way Christ loved the church. He gave himself up for her, but this is his church. It's God's church. Secondly, we see here that the church is the pillar and foundation of the truth. We are about truth, beloved. Amen? Amen. Because we're about Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. And as the church, as the body of Christ, this is our goal. Yes, we're to make disciples. That's why we're still here. Paul said, uh, Philippians 1, to live is Christ, to die is gain. To die would be better because he would be with Christ. Amen? Amen? But he was left here for the sake of the body, for the church. And it's true of each of us. If you're still breathing, Christian, you're here for the glory of God and for the good of those around you. Amen? We are the church. And as the church of God, we are the pillar and the foundation of the truth. The truth is supported by the church. The truth is believed in by the church. The truth is taught by the church. The truth is proclaimed by the church. Amen? And the truth is to be defended by the church. Defended. And sometimes that brings us into the public square, amen? Sometimes it makes us dip our toe into the political realm because the truth permeates every aspect of society. We proclaim the truth that humanity was made in the image of God, amen? Unlike chihuahuas, for instance. That's a good dog right there. A chihuahua, though, I'm sorry. That's a degradation of DNA and genetics. But I digress. Ken Ham does a really good talk about that, by the way. You can Google that after church. But it's great. It's, it is, I mean, it's gold. It really is. Sorry. Just thinking back through it. It's really good. But it, mankind is the pinnacle of creation. And we alone are made in the image of God. And as such, life is precious. Amen? That's why abortion is still murder no matter how popular the notion gets, no matter how it's relabeled in the political realm and on social media as the rights of reproduction or women's reproductive rights, murder is not a reproductive right. It's a horror. And so the truth must be told, amen? The truth must be told that there are nice people in Mormonism. They're great they're kind. They would make wonderful neighbors. But they are damned to hell because they do not know the true Jesus. And the church must proclaim truth. Amen? Is there anything greater we can do for a neighbor, for a loved one? Anything greater? Anything higher? Anything more worthwhile than proclaiming that Jesus saves? People need to know this. Amen? Amen? And so the church, we are the pillar, we are the foundation, we're the front line, we're the back line, we're the infantry, we're the air force, we're the marines, right? We're special forces that go behind enemy lines. The church is all of those things, beloved. We're not to be complacent. We're the pillar, we're the foundation of the truth. But there's one other aspect that Paul just gets just, just a shimmer of here. When he goes into this next section here, we begin to see, he says, in case I'm delayed, I write to you so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. And by common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. And there are many different perspectives and commentaries pertaining exactly to what this mystery is here specifically. But this ideal of mystery is something that Paul speaks much of in the New Testament. And so what I want us to do is to take a step back before we get into this great mystery of godliness and talk about mystery and the mystery of the church because this is the third truth here. See, the church is in fact a mystery. In fact, let me invite you. Let's turn back in Romans. If you're in 1 Timothy, go to the left, all right? And go back just a few books back. You're going to get to Romans. If you've gone to Acts, you've gone just a little bit too far. Turn to Romans and then go to chapter 16. And I want you to see a great definition of what, of what a mystery is. Romans 16. Look at verse 25 and verse 26, if you will. 
Paul writes, oh, I'm in 1 Corinthians. Let me get to the right book here. Romans, I, see, I didn't go far enough. Acts, Romans, oh, there we go. Romans 16. Now to him who is able to strengthen you, according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which has been kept secret for long ages past, but now is manifested and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the eternal God, has been made known to all the Gentiles, leading to obedience of faith. And he goes on, the great doxology here, I believe, to the only wise God through Jesus Christ. Be the glory forever. Amen. Amen? Amen. But note what he says here in these verses. He gives us a great definition of a biblical mystery. The church as a mystery here. He begins to tell us that a mystery is that which was kept secret for long ages past, but has been made known now. That is a biblical mystery. It's something that was beforehand unknown, but was made known now. It's that simple, beloved. This is not the Scooby-Doo gang kind of mystery. This is not Agatha Christie kind of mystery. This is something which was unknown before and has been made known. This is what the Bible describes as mystery. Turn to the book of Ephesians. If you're there, just go to the right. Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, then Ephesians. You know how you remember what order Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians are in? Girls eat popcorn. Girls eat popcorn. That's right. Galatians, Ephesians, girls eat popcorn. Philippians, Colossians. That's free. You can tuck that away for later. But turn to the book of Ephesians and specifically go to chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. And note in the first two verses, Paul writes, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, if indeed you heard of the stewardship of God's grace which was given to me for you. Now, that's odd. You know what's odd about this? There's no verb in these verses here. So jump down to verse 14 for a moment. It should be on that same page. Look down at verse 14. Paul picks up again. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. You see, in verse 1, this, this is where he begins. For this reason, I, Paul, verse 14, bow my knees before the Father. This is the sentence. Everything between in verse 2 through 13 is a parenthetical thought. It's just a rabbit trail, a God-inspired rabbit trail about the mystery of the church. And so I don't want us to miss this because, again, a mystery was beforehand unknown, unknown in the Old Testament, made known in the New Testament, specifically here with the Apostle Paul. And so you see verses 1 through 13, this is actually a one long run-on sentence. One long run-on sentence. It's not great grammatically speaking, but it's significant. I mean, it's monumental, theologically speaking. One long sentence. Verse 1 to verse 14, he picks back up with verse 1. Again, 2 through 13 is this mystery of the church, this parenthetical thought. And what we see here is that Paul is the apostle that's given the stewardship of this mystery. The word stewardship we see in Romans, we see in Ephesians here, and this ideal in 1 Timothy is picked up on this ideal of a mystery is what we would call a dispensation or an economy. It's the same word. It's a way of God's dealing with a people in a time. It's a biblical principle. And Paul is charged as the steward of two great truths that were unknown. Two great revelations. Uh, you know, and what's the word revelation mean, remember? Those of you who are taking the hermeneutic class through Chafer right now, you know, it means the unveiling, right? The revealing, the, the unveiling, if you will. Apocalypsis, the apocalypto, the book of Revelation. It's the revealing of the truth, of the end. And so Paul gets told two of these things. If, and, and this is free. I don't think this is in your notes. But one is the mystery of the gospel of salvation. And he writes the book of Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and Galatians. Those four letters all speak about this mystery of the gospel. And he compares and contrasts the gospel and the law in Romans and in Galatians. 
He gives, he gives practicality to the gospel in First and Second Corinthians. But the other mystery is the mystery of the church. And it's the mystery of the church that Paul talks about in Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians. Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. But Paul is the steward of those two great mysteries. And, and both of those mysteries are connected with the grace of God for Gentile and Jew alike in a new thing called the church. And so this mystery, go back to Ephesians. Look at verse 3. He says that by revelation, that's the unveiling, the apocalypto, by revelation there was made known to me mysterion, the mystery. Again, not Scooby-Doo. This is previously unknown, now known. This is not like a murder mystery or anything like that. I just want to make sure that's clear. Our English doesn't capture fully this idea, which is why we're spending the bulk of today speaking to this end. He says, by revelation there was made known to me the mystery as I wrote before in brief, about which when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. So this mystery, again, something mysterious in the mod, not, not mysterious in the modern sense, but something unknown previously, revealed now. It's now revealed. This mystery spoken here is not that the Gentiles were going to be blessed by the law. Not that the Gentiles could go under the law and become Jews. Not that they would be blessed in that regard. They were blessed under the old covenant that way. But that was not mystery. That was proclaimed. That they could be blessed by coming into the household of Israel, the nation of Israel, by being recognized as part of Israel. But that's not what this mystery is speaking to. This is something new and something that was unknown. And this is tantamount to rightly interpreting Scripture. If you miss this, and so much of Christianity has missed this, many in the hyper-reformed camps and many in the hyper-charismatic camps interpret this ideal of mysterion, of mystery, incorrectly. And it damages not just their eschatology, but their Israelology, their soteriology, and their ecclesiology are all tainted. All of those great doctrines are tainted by a misunderstanding of mystery here that Paul reveals. This mystery is that Gentiles would be equal heirs with fellow Jews in one new body called the church. That's the mystery. And it seems so obvious to us. If you use, as some of you learned this morning, a consistent, literal, grammatical, hermeneutic, interpretive principle. Amen? Not changing how we interpret prophetic passages versus other historical passages, but using the same hermeneutic principle, interpreting all Scripture in that way. It should be very obvious. Look at verse 6 of Ephesians 3. He says that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body. Not of Israel. Of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. You see, the content of the mystery is that the body of Christ, all our fellow heirs, fellow members, and fellow partakers together. That was unheard of in the Old Testament. This was unknown in the Old Testament prophecies. The prophets did not speak to this. They talked of the blessings of Messiah. They talked of blessings to Israel. They talked about Israel's past, present, and future. And there are many of those promises that are yet to be fulfilled and will be fulfilled literally in the future. Many in a literal millennial kingdom. That Psalm 2, Ezekiel, Isaiah points to, and certainly Revelation chapter 20. But this is not Israel specifically. This is the church, the mystery. Back up to verse 5. This mystery, which in other generations, again, was not made known to the sons of men as it is now revealed. Again, that is that apocalypto, revealing, revelation, unveiling. Amen? It's now made known to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. That's Ephesians 3, 5. Now, there's one key word here, and it should be highlighted to let you know that this word isn't in the text in the Greek here. It's the word as, and this is a problematic word. And so again, I think this is crucial to rightly dividing Scripture. So we're spending some time here. This may be a little deeper than some of you cared to dive into this morning, but I hope you will be blessed with some understanding here. 
because this word as is a loaded word. It can mean two different things. It can be used as a comparative or a declarative. And which one it is, is vital to rightly understanding what a mystery is. But we're not left in the dark here. I, don't, I do not believe this is used as a comparison here. A comparative would explain something further or a declarative, which means not then but now. I think that's what this is. It's a declarative because it's mystery and it's spelled out very clearly. He's saying it wasn't there before as it is now. Does that make sense? He's not saying that we just see it more clearly now. And see, the reason this is important is because a large segment, and sadly, it seems to be a growing segment of Christianity, believes the church existed in the Old Testament, that Israel was the church, and that is false. And that's damning in a lot of ways. We can talk more about that maybe on a Sunday night or a Wednesday night coming up. But the church was unknown in the Old Testament. The word church generically means, it is ecclesia, it generically means a gathering, And Israel is, in that sense, a gathering of people in the Old Testament. True. But they are not the church ecclesia proper, the way the New Testament describes. In fact, my contention is that not one usage of the word Israel in the New Testament, not one usage, speaks to the church. It may speak of part of the church, but that would be the Jewish aspect that is now brought in with the Gentiles that make up the church. Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum with Chafer Theological Seminary, Ariel Ministries, has a great work on this. I shared this with Josh this past week. Couldn't remember who it was. Tremendous help. And if you're interested in that, you can shoot me a text or an email, and I will forward that on to you. And you can spend some time, and I mean some time, looking at every use of the word Israel in the New Testament. And you'll see in context, it does not mean Old Testament. I mean, it does not mean the church. It always means what the Old Testament Israel means. Be they unsaved or be they now saved in the church body of Christ. But they're still talking about Israel. And I think that's a very verifiable fact. But as declarative, meaning something that wasn't there. So how do we know for sure that's what he's talking about? I believe Paul intended this to be declarative, meaning he's saying this mystery did not exist. It now does exist because of his use of the word mystery with it. This is new information that had not been one. And let's verify it. Remember, Colossians and Ephesians are they contain much of the same information, just to two. Most likely, they were birthed from the same original letter, and they're you know these were uh, circular letters, so they would be shared from church. That's why they have some similar spirit through Paul. But he writes these two letters, the same time period. And notice what he says. If we want to understand what Paul means by an unveiling, by a mystery, and by the word as here in this comparative or declarative sense, I think looking elsewhere where Paul uses these phrases would be very helpful. In Colossians chapter 1, look at verses 24 through 27. Paul writes, Now I rejoice in my suffering for your sake. That preaches right there, doesn't it, beloved? In our suffering, we usually whine and cry and complain. Paul rejoiced in his suffering because the gospel was shared further. We could take a note from that. He says, and I fill up what is lacking of Christ's afflictions in my flesh on behalf of his body, which is the church, of which I was made a minister according to the stewardship. That's that same word. Dispensation, economy, stewardship from God, given to me for you, so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the Word of God. That is, note this, the mystery, which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but has now been manifested to His saints, to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. You know what he's talking about? Same thing in Romans 16, 25. Same thing in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 14. He's talking about the mystery of Christ in us, the church. This is the truth of the church, beloved. In its context, the mystery is the church, that the church did not exist before then. So if it didn't exist before then in the Old Testament, when did the church begin? And I think we have some contextual clues for that as well. If it's a mystery... And it is a mystery. 
in which Jew and Gentile both become this new organism called the church, we need to see when it began. Well, letter D in your notes is that the church began on the day of Pentecost. The church began on the day of Pentecost. It had been prophesied, Old Testament, absolutely amen. But it was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. In fact, if you want to just do another little quick dive here, well, this will be the middle of the pool, if you will. Not completely deep in, right? But not shallow either. But just jot down Matthew 16, 18. And you remember what Jesus said there? I will build my church. I will build. Present, future tense rather, meaning the church had not started yet. Amen? I will build my church in the gates of Hades. The gates of Hades will not overpower it. So it did not exist in Matthew 16, 18. So not yet. It was not yet built. Jot down 1 Corinthians 12, 13. In this text, Paul says we were all baptized into one body. One body. It's the church. So in 1 Corinthians 12, 13... The church did exist. So Jew and Gentile were being baptized into one body, the church. So somewhere between Jesus saying, I will build the church, and Paul declaring in 1 Corinthians 12 that the church is already in existence, somewhere between those two, the church began. Amen? There's a couple other contextual keys. Acts 1.8. I'll just jot, just jot that down. And Acts 11.15. It happened somewhere between those two because in Acts 1.8, the Holy Spirit had not yet fallen, giving birth to the body of Christ where Jew and Gentile would come together. That happened in Acts 2. We read about it. And then elsewhere, two other places too, right? But in Acts 11.15, the Holy Spirit was spoken of as having fallen on the apostles. And what what the writer is saying here, what Luke is recording for us, is that these people are being saved the same way we were saved earlier, which he was speaking of in Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 2. So it happened somewhere between there. So where, where did it happen? It happened on the day of Pentecost again, which is Acts chapter 2. The church was born in Acts chapter 2, the mystery. It did not exist in the Old Testament. The church did not replace Israel. The church is not Israel. But Jew and Gentile alike become the new body of Christ. Amen? That's something new. That's the mystery. We spend a lot of time on it. Isn't the gospel the most important thing? It is. But understanding what is spoken of, of the church and of this mystery will help us then to rightly understand the need for the gospel today. Because there's only one way by which people can be saved. Amen? Today. And it's by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? So notice this great hymn. Turn back now to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. We see this great common confession, which is the mystery of godliness. This isn't specifically, I know some commentators would disagree with this. Some believe that this means how we can be godly. I don't think that's at all what's in context because he's talking about the mystery of the church, the mystery of the gospel. So this mystery of godliness is, is, is part of that and so we have now what most believe is a, an early hymn of the church recorded for us. Who was, it, it speaks of the great mystery here of Jesus specifically, who was manifested in the flesh, vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the word, world, excuse me, and then taken up in glory. There are six phrases here that are packed with theology. So note, he who was manifest in the flesh. Manifested in the flesh is the incarnation of Jesus. Eternal God humbles himself and becomes obedient. He takes on flesh that he might give his life for us. Amen? Praise God for that. That's, un, that's un, unknown. Yes, after the pronouncement of, of the Messiah... You saw inklings in some false religions where Satan would get just glimpses. Because remember, Satan's not all-knowing, beloved. Amen? Amen? He doesn't know everything. He only knows what God reveals. But you better bet he knows the Bible. Living by the Lord throughout history, we have it all here now, he would absolutely seek to distort. And there have been some distortions. Man, We see glimpses of this as far back as Genesis where fallen angels take being called the Nephilim, right? There's a lot of crazy talk about such things, but if we take 
the literal, excuse me, the consistent, literal, grammatical, historical lives of human women and had some demonic offspring, unredeemable offspring. Christ didn't die for angels, remember. He's been perverting and sought to pervert that thread of the offspring of humanity, but that's for a whole nother study. <laughs> but Satan has sought to disrupt, but Christ, eternal God, became the God-man so that he could pay the price for our sins. What does this have to do? Humble himself and become obedient even to death on a cross. Philippians chapter 2 speaks to that great humbling aspect of the ministry of Jesus Christ. And secondly, it says, was vindicated in the Spirit or by the Spirit. Some translations, I think maybe the ESV uses the word by the Spirit. That's probably closer to the ideal here. Vindicated in or by the Spirit, meaning the vindication took place in or by or through or according to the Spirit. Jesus was affirmed as being God and being Messiah. You see, Romans chapter 8, verse 11 speaks to this vindication. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also all bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. The spirit's testament, testifying his, his, his testament was God. He was seen by angels, good angels, evil angels, heavenly angels, fallen angels, all attested to Christ. Fallen angels, or excuse me, yeah, demons would, would be possessing or, or oppressing people in the days of Jesus. And when he would approach, the spirit that was on them or in them would cry out, Son, that's right. The demons would testify who Jesus was. Holy angels were there at his birth, at his, throughout his ministry, and especially at his resurrection. In this Jesus. but his perfect life, his sinless life, and his resurrection from the dead. Unheard of, beloved. Jesus, this gospel message preached to the Gentiles, not just the Jews, but among the nations. It means the Gentile people believed on in the world. The gospel message went forth and people believed. Revival began happening as dead gave way to life, right? Right? First, uh, excuse me, Ephesians chapter 1. We were dead in our trespasses and sins in which we used to walk in our former manner of life according to the prince and the power, the principles of the spirit that is in this world. That's the demonic spirit, Satan's spirit. But God, through Christ Jesus, has saved us by grace through faith. Amen? That's that great argument in Ephesians chapter 2. And so people begin to hear the word as it's preached. People begin to believe the word as it's preached and people are saved. You know how people are saved today? The same way. There's no other means that we've been given. Miracles do not save people, beloved. They do not. In fact, Jesus makes that very clear in Luke when La uh, the rich man and Lazarus in that story of their departing into Sheol, into the grave, even if Moses or the prophets went back from the dead, people wouldn't believe. That's pretty miraculous, amen? Miracles don't save, Jesus saves. It's the gospel message. Faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. It's the word of Christ still that must be preached, proclaimed, and believed on in order for salvation to take place, amen? Amen? I hope we believe that, church. Romans chapter 10 speaks to that end. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? And that didn't just mean me. That means us proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? We must preach so that people can believe. And then the final testament that this gospel is true and that Jesus is who he says he is, he was taken up in glory, received up in glory at the right hand of the Father the side of approval, the side of blessing, amen? Showing that the sacrifice of Jesus for his bride was affirmed by the Father. 
So this is a summation of the gospel truth. Again, Paul being a steward of the gospel and a steward of the church and the two together in Christ. Paul being the great steward of this mystery tells us not only of his longing to be with those people, and so he writes to them because he's not with them, not only in this great description of the church, which was a mystery hidden in ages past, but the gospel of truth by which we are saved. Folks, this is the same thing that we are to be about today, which is why the church is to be the steward and pillar of the truth. We are to uphold the truth of the gospel today, just like Paul did in his day, amen? Now, I'm not Paul, you're not Paul, but God doesn't need other Pauls. God needs Davids and Natalies, right? Chucks, Amys, Brocks, Maddies, Sydneys. I'm just looking around different names here, right? He needs Chases. He needs Avas. He needs Tessas. He needs the little Blakes. Those little Blakes too. He needs all of us, beloved, amen? He needs Bettys and Paulas and Brookses, Kathys. He needs Laura's. He needs one Laura. We don't need any more Laura's. Oh, Lord. Amen, everybody says. Thank you. Now, people getting saved all over the world right now because of that great proclamation. No, no, I'm just kidding. But Chrissy's. The world needs us to preach the truth. Amen? So may we be faithful. May we be faithful. And, and, and you know, in order for us to preach it, we have to believe it. Amen? Now, let me ask you a couple quick, quick questions here. Pop quiz. How many of you know everything there is to know about God? How many of you are seeking to learn more? Good. How many of you know everything there is to know about the gospel? How many of you are seeking to understand the gospel better and better every day? How many of you are waiting from, for divine revelation from heaven to explain to you exactly what the gospel is? How many of you are waiting for the words of the scriptures that have been given to us once and for all to be illuminated? We need to be illuminated to the revelation given. Amen? Amen. So I may have said that in a little... Thing we need for life and godliness. Amen? So how many of you know this word as well as you need to know it? How many of you want to know it better? Let's be good stewards of the truth. Amen? Let's be good stewards of the church. So for us to do that, we have to believe the truth. For us to believe the truth, we have to know the truth. And guess what? Truth has a name, and it's Jesus. And if we know him, we will be set free. You shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Thanks, Craig. So I'm going to ask you to bow your head with me for a moment. And this is important that we not distract anyone. So I would ask you, have you believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ? In Romans 9, we read part of this earlier. Excuse me, Romans 10, verses 9 and 10. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, leading to righteousness. With the mouth he confesses, leading to salvation. Have you believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ this way? If you have not done so before now, beloved, believe on Jesus Christ. No music playing, no fanfare, no asking you to quietly slip your hand up. If you believe, then believe. And for those of us who do believe, our public declaration is what the Bible calls and identifies as believer's baptism. That is when we tell the world that I belong to Jesus Christ. So if you believe in the Lord Jesus and you have not declared that publicly, beloved, pray that you would honor what we see as the testament of Scripture, that people are baptized after believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 10, 13 says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Are there specific words you have to say? Is there a, is there a sinner's prayer as we've 
I think, sadly and wrongly led people to believe is biblical. The Bible tells us no such thing. Simply, we see cases where there's unbelief in death, and then there's belief in life. Have you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ? Consider something like, I think is the true sinner's prayer, where we read about in Matthew's gospel, where that great sinner cried out, Lord, have mercy on me, the sinner. Not comparing, but recognizing that his sin separates him from holy God. Would you believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ in that way?